Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 16th Cine Youth Festival. My name is Ryan Saunders, and I'm the Cine Youth Festival Director, and we're so thrilled to be having this conversation about films in the Speak Memory Documentary Program. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to quickly thank our sponsor, Adobe, um, for sponsoring this program, and without them, the, this, this film festival wouldn't be possible, so thank you to them. Um, we've got two filmmakers with us here tonight. Um, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves first. We have Grady. Um, so Grady, if you could maybe introduce yourself and talk a little bit about um, your film. Hi, my name is Grady Rodois O'Brien. My film is called The Impossible Way, and it is about the environmental impact of methane, a gas that comes from cows. Thank you so much. And Pixie, if you could introduce yourself in your film. Hi, uh, I'm Pixie. My uh, film is Elizabeth Antiqua. It was my senior film at Emerson College. Uh, it is a short animated documentary about the first woman to design a typeface. Thank you. So both of your films are um, very unique and cover radically different topics. So um, that's you know very exciting. And Grady, you know, I, we'll start with you. Um, if you could maybe let the audience know too, you you sort of bring the youth into cine youth, um, and that's why it's like so wonderful having you here. Uh, you're one of the younger filmmakers in the program, um, but this is a film you made about a year ago. So I wonder if you could talk about um, just like you know your interest in film and sort of how you started getting into it, um, being such a young filmmaker. Well, uh, it started when I. Well, it actually started from very close, like probably a couple days after I was born is probably when everything started because my parents had wanted to had wanted me to be a vegetarian. And since gas that comes from cows is called methane, and that is a gas that is infecting the environment, I am a vegetarian which means that i don't buy burgers and eat meat and that kind of stuff so that way i'm sort of saving the environment as well as these animals which is why i was inspired to make this movie is because a lot of people are not aware about this and a lot of people wonder why you would want to be a vegetarian and i thought well despite the fact that i am only young and i am <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I'm not very old. I feel like I could still do something inspiring. Well, you certainly can, and that's why we're so glad you were able to bring your film to us. Uh, it's very impassioned. Um, it's clearly something that you you believe in very strongly. Um, and so, I guess you know, I'll move to to Pixie. You know, your film also feels like a passion project in a way because the subject is is so unique. Um, and you clearly put so much effort into like letting everyone know about um, the, this woman, Elizabeth Friedlander, who created the typeface. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you, when you, how you first heard about her um, and sort of what drew you to her story. Yeah, so I, um, I have been kind of a graphic design and typeface nerd for a couple of years. Um, I did some uh, design study at RISD and um, I wanted my senior project to be about uh, uh, there are, or women making fonts because um, like I say in the film, it uh, was very male dominated for a while. And I thought it was interesting that like a lot of the art world that the aesthetics and what we consider to be good and readable and pleasant to the eye were determined by men. Um, and that's true of a lot of the fonts that we still use. A lot of the, the classic go-to fonts are still aesthetics that we rely on that were created by men. Um, so I started off researching just um, female typeface designers and my project actually began just like I was going to talk about them in general. And then I realized I really just want to talk about Elizabeth. So. Okay. So you were initially specifically looking for women typeface designers and then that was mm -hmm. what led you to Elizabeth's story. Yeah. Gotcha. And, you know, so I was wondering too about the, the research process and like the history that you came across um, related to Elizabeth. Um, mm -hmm. 
And yeah, I was just, you know, it's, it's interesting always going back with like older primary sources and just older history and seeing the way people are represented over time. And I was wondering if you could talk about just the, the journey going through the, the research process. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm still researching her. Um, she's kind of my favorite subject, but um, I, so there is a, a book about Elizabeth Friedlander, uh, New Borders, that was written by um, a woman and uh, it's a limited edition book that there's, I think there's only 500 copies in the world. And it just so happens that the Boston College Library has one in their rare books collection. So I was able to go visit this book, which is the primary source on all things Elizabeth Friedlander, which was really great. And that was kind of my jumping off point um, because it's, I, it, it, um, it is the working life of Elizabeth Friedlander. And there was not um, a lot about her personal life. There's some, um, I don't wanna say speculation, but there's like some asides and some personal letters that still exist, but that is kind of the primary source that I had to rely on. Gotcha, I see. And then, so related to that then in terms of research, Grady, I was wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, your film contains so much information, if you could talk about just the research process um, and how you, uh, collected all of that for the movie. Well, um, uh, what is, uh, what has been a large part of my research is, uh, I've been, I've been learning a lot from reading, uh, articles and stuff like that. And also just from, uh, I think at one point there was a unit back before the pandemic in fourth grade where we all read books about the environment. And I learned that probably, I think it was probably there that I learned for the first time that methane was uh, the second most powerful greenhouse gas. And, um, and, uh, um, and I also, like I said, I've been reading online articles. I've been researching and looking up things and reading things about that different experts on these topics say. And I've been putting it all together and then I put it into a script and then I filmed it on about like the last couple days of the year in 2019. Like literally on New Year's Eve is probably when I filmed some of the last things. And um and I and, and my mom and I edited it into a thing and we had a finished movie and that's how it started. And you know, so you mentioned how the um, you were doing this in 2019. So a lot of time has passed since um, you made the film. And I was curious, as you've been getting older, um, what ha how have you stayed climate conscious? How have you uh, kept up this passion of yours? Well, I am still a vegetarian, and I mean, I can't really speak for the rest of my life. But I right now, for in terms of at the moment, I am planning to continue being a vegetarian for the rest of my life I could go to college and then all of a sudden that all of a sudden decide I want to eat meat who knows but um I've been I've been keeping up being a vegetarian and I've been eating impossible burgers which is what my movie is called the impossible way a lot I've been um I have I've been like conscious about recycling and composting things and I've been doing what most people recommend to do to help save the environment. I've been doing global friendly things that are small amounts, but they still count technically. So I guess it's still important. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that you're, you're still soldiering on. Um, you're an inspiration for us all. Um, I did want to quickly ask you about the Impossible Burgers and if – did you ever share your film um, with the with the Impossible Burger Company? Have they seen the film? I feel like you should bring it to their attention. Uh, well, I have been thinking about doing that, and I never really got around to it once the pandemic started. But after the pandemic, I am considering contacting them and sharing the film with them, and seeing what they think of it because. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah, it sounds. It sounds like they would really enjoy it having a movie, even if it's just by an eleven-year-old kid. 
made a better burger. Absolutely, I think so. I, I think they would they would love to see your film. Um, we actually have some questions coming in from the audience. So the first one I'll ask it for for Pixie is someone from the audience was wondering, can you talk about the way history has treated and represented Elizabeth? And so we talked about this a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I guess maybe you could talk about um, the way your film fits in with the history, uh, like just contributing to the conversation. Um, and yeah, what you discovered about her on your journey. Yeah, so that um, book I mentioned was written by Pauline Pauker, I believe in late 80s, early 90s. And when she was conducting that research, um, everyone told her, oh, you're not gonna find anything on this woman. Like, this is a lost cause. She's She's been forgotten, like don't, don't bother making a book. Um, so I, I actually got to um, reach out and speak to Pauline Pauker who is, uh, at the time that we spoke, was 92 and a half, as she told me, uh, probably 93 now. Um, and she was just over the moon that people were talking about Elizabeth because she was told when she was doing this research, um, in a similar position to me, that like, you're just not gonna find anything about her. Um, so she has been very excited. There was also um, a grad student at the University of Victoria, I believe, who has digitized New Borders to make it more accessible for people online because it is a rare book. Um, which is very interesting because we were doing these projects without knowing each other at the same time. So she was, um, you know, working with New Borders and I was working with New Borders. As far as how Elizabeth has been represented, represented, um, she's obviously been incredibly underrepresented. A lot of people, even in like the font and typeface community, have never, never heard of her. Um, it is interesting to me that kind of the narrative that gets pushed, is, like that the, the the big, um, the kind of the quote that follows her is that she was a demure spinster, um, which I think is very funny considering this woman, you know, fled Nazis and fled like fascists in Italy um, and like continually used her work to like rebuild a life for herself over and over again. Um, and just had like this storied, interesting professional life across countries. And that's that the idea that she was demure um, is what follows her and instead of kind of you know a brave very cool lady <laughs> right all the incredible things that you know, she's accomplished that have like lived on since then um yeah i mean that's why what i was so drawn to when i first watched your film um because it, it feels in a way like a revisionist history even if like i wasn't familiar with the initial history it was just the fact that it was like shedding all this light on um, a topic I hadn't previously come across, or even you know, personally, just as not being as familiar with graphic design and different typefaces, something about the the individual labor um, involved in such a thing that I that I hadn't considered before. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about like sort of the the actual process of making this film and the the animation. Um, I was really surprised when I, so I, I found your website when I was doing some research um, about the film that you had used a, a clay model. Um, and that was just having watched it, that's something I probably wouldn't have guessed as just a viewer of the film. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about just like that animation process and involving clay with the, the digital look of the film. Yeah, um, so I, the, the film is primarily done in Maya, a good amount of help from Adobe too, but um, all the 3D animation was done in Maya and um, there isn't, I, modeling is not my strong suit in the world of 3D. Um, so I, just so happened I was in another class where the professor had given us a hunk of clay for something else and we were, uh, Retopologizing them, which is uh, well, part of the process is Emerson had just come into these three D scanners, so we were three D scanning models. Um, and uh, retopologizing them, Maya, like putting them into the scene, cleaning them up, um, making them like workable and animatable. Um, so I had an idea of what I wanted my version of Elizabeth to look like in my head, and I was having trouble executing it, um, just from scratch in a three D space. So I, you know, I, I played with a lot of clay as a kid. I, I went ahead and, and built her from clay and. You know, took her into the lab and scanned her, and then cleaned her up in, in the virtual space, um, and, and and approached it that way. Yeah, it was such a just an incredibly unique way of uh, presenting history and presenting someone from history, just by having the typeface um, decorating her body. Um, 
it was just super impressive. Um, an another question from the audience um, is for you, Grady. And the, they were wondering if, y are you going to pursue a film career? You know, you're such a young filmmaker and you have your whole life ahead of you. What do you think? Um, are you gonna become like a climate activist or do you think that you'll actually keep pursuing film? You seem to have a knack for it. Uh, thank you. And um, I, I've been thinking about that. And uh, like I mentioned before with the vegetarian thing, who knows? I could go off to college and completely decide to be something else. But I could decide to be something else tomorrow. But right now, I think that pursuing a film career wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, my mom is a filmmaker. My dad is an author. You know, I mean, following in their footsteps would be great. But again, I could decide to be something else. I think if I weren't to be a filmmaker, I would probably be a major climate activist. Would probably be another thing. I would probably still do like, you know, maybe climate activism films probably while filmmaking because filmmaking is such like this powerful moving tool. And if someone were to write an article online and have information backing it up, people, yes, if you were to read the article, you would believe the article, well, hopefully. But if you were to watch a movie, people are drawn to movies because it's this blur of motion and picture, and it's, more, it's, it's like talking to a real human. It's watching a real human say something in words that's proving their point. And that's why it can be such a powerful tool to move people into thinking that there that this cause is a true and important cause. I was wondering, um, f speaking on that true and important cause, um, were you able to convince your brother in your impassioned speech? I, I love the presence of Jeff in your film. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about working with Jeff and what it was like making a film while Jeff was like throwing garbage at you. Um, well, Technically, his name is Huck. I cast him as Jeff because Huck is a great name, but for some reason, I was in this phase where I like to call everything Jeff. So I called Huck Jeff. And it, it's slightly embarrassing, but it, it's it, this, is, this is a Q&A. I have to tell the complete truth. It's it's the press. So um, uh, I, I, I working with a three-year-old is a challenge because now he's four, and he's slightly more civilized, sort of. And he, he won't exactly, like, if we were to tell him to do something, he would just say, okay, which is a good thing. Because, well, if I had gone upstairs and woke him up from his nap, then maybe he wouldn't have been as cooperative. But that day he was being calm, which I think is a good thing. So when we told him to throw garbage at me, he was very happy that he's able to throw garbage at his big brother. Cause you know, if you want to walk up to a three year old and tell them that they get to throw garbage at people, I think all three year olds would be like, Oh, I finally get to, I finally get to be out of control and not have these big people telling me what to do. So, uh, it was, it was really, it was really fun to work with him. And, uh, sometimes his aiming was a little bit off, which we had to correct. And, um, I don't think he was supposed to throw a beer can, but I think we accidentally got a beer can and he was throwing that, which we probably shouldn't have had a, a, a three-year-old be throwing, which, but you know, we just rolled with it because I mean, all filmmakers have to deal with setbacks, whether or not it's your set collapsing or accidentally getting a beer can for a three-year-old to throw. Absolutely, thank you for such a great answer. Yeah, he adds a sense of danger to the film. He gives it a, uh... He gives it a, a nice intensity. The the threat of Jeff. Um, I and it's nice to it's nice to know that you like decided to to call him Jeff. That that was a creative decision because um, it does it hits harder. It's nice. It's like Jeff, stop throwing things at me. Uh, very very good. Um, well, thank you both so much for for taking the time to chat with us tonight. Um, this has been a lovely conversation. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone who's watching enjoys the films and has a chance to check out more films at CineYouth. 
Um, but until then, have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.